Welcome back. We have a lot to cover today, so let's jump right into it. At this point, you've heard me say this many times, motivate, engage, educate, and move to action. What we're going to do right now is break down each of these areas. It's really critical. So I've touched on a lot of these areas throughout the course of the show. Why am I coming back to this now? Because I really want to give you that framework. Break it down into the very specific segments so you can understand how this all plays together and give you that framework for your mind. Let's get into this. The motivation piece first. We have two pieces of it. The first one is what I call the hook, and the second is how do we create an emotional response. How do we hook that audience in? A straightforward approach is to let them know why the heck they are taking the course and communicate the benefits they will receive in a way that's relevant to them. The great thing is people understand they need to know about money. This is a known fact from various surveys. People agreed they need to know how to handle their finances. The great thing about money is there is a strong reason. We have very strong whys with financial literacy. Utilize it at the beginning. Hook your audience in and get them to take action on what they've learned through strong reasons that they'll remember after your event is over. But this initial why will really hook them in, get them to pay attention and take notes and be active, engaged learners. I remember in school, I was like, I'm never going to need this. This teacher never gave me a strong why. But with money, there always is. People have money spent mentally before they even have it. For some, the why is a dream vacation, and for others, it's sending their kids to college. What would you like to do with that money? Lifestyle. I touched on this before. We always include a lifestyle and dream activity in with every group of students we teach. We get to learn about them. It helps them to identify those personal reasons. Somebody's picturing that vacation, or has that picture of the vacation up on their screensaver, or the place they want to go to. It's much easier for them to be reminded of money, instead of, I want to see my bank account with five zeros, instead of negative two. Whatever the case may be, those visual images, that lifestyle, that dream, that we can help them achieve is really critical. We address that. We want to make that connection between money and lifestyle. Can you speak a little bit about the benefits? We spoke a lot about this in the study session. How the status benefits and the future benefits. So if you said a hundred thousand dollars after that same project, what would you like to do with that? You can see the benefits. You set them in a delay time. Issues and problems that other people face. And with the benefits thing, we can only assume that that with the consequences of the game, so we understand. Here's what happens if I don't get my time, if I don't get my time, if I don't get the money I'm investing. But here's what happens, and should happen, if I do. So today we're going to start talking a little bit about investing, understanding what it is to get my time. What is the benefit that investing can do to you? How many people have missed out on their money that they should have? They don't have to work for every dollar. How many people would like that? Well, how many people who wouldn't? You know, we need to be talking about how we can get our money working for us so we don't have to wait for every dollar until we're 90 years old, getting that money, going to work. But when we do that, it will only be money. It really depends on your time. But what are the benefits that you get in that system? You know, if you're working with individuals that are blue collar workers that are used to working hard every day, maybe they don't have much saved up in their time. I guess I would recommend sharing with them the benefits of being able to learn about investing and putting a little money away, a little money aside, so they have to continue doing that and staying part of life. Benefits are solely driven by your audience. Your benefit may not be the same for a little kid or for a young adult. So we want to make sure that we have the benefit of your audience and make sure that we're providing you with the best benefit that you can have in your own time. 
We need to be real. Come off as you, as a person. Adjust your language in different ways to share your information. Come off as yourself. You don't want to pretend to be a 15-year-old kid in high school when you're 70 years old. You won't because you have unique things that you bring into the classroom. It doesn't matter what age you are, what background you have. With your passion, you can share with all age groups and you're going to be able to connect with them as well because many of the things that you went through when you were 17 is the same thing that they're going through, just in a slightly different way. So there's many ways to stay connected to your audience while being real, while being you. It builds trust. It builds that connection between you and your audience. Relating to your audience is also important. You've done your homework up to this point. You're going to be, well, you're going to get up in front of that class, you're going to be excellent. So if you've done your pre-surveys, even if meeting with some people that will be in your audience, so if you've taken time to create something with them or learn about what they're into, and even some of those other activities that we did where you look at our high school yearbook, think about how we were at that time. Try to put yourself in that spot. Empathize with your audience. Storylines are a great added feature, especially as you become a more sophisticated educator. Initially, you want to start to build up your story banks, meaning having stories for a variety of different situations. People remember stories. It's easy for you to share because it's something that's on top of your mind. You can convey these stories with emotion in a way that people understand. And also, stories are easy for people to remember. As you progress more as an educator, you can start to intermix your storylines throughout the event. Maybe you want to have an opener and maybe sometime in the middle you want to interject a few little pieces and then maybe you want to have a conclusion at the end or maybe you want to do like reality shows do and have that cliffhanger where you can bridge that gap to the next course you're going to teach. Bottom line, stories will really help you integrate your personality 
into the lessons you teach. Very similar to what we do on TV programs. So, if you go back and, and, and think about your audience, what TV shows they watch, pop on a few of those shows, watch how they develop their storyline over that half hour or hour segment. Pay attention to those clickers and try to build a storyline that you can utilize in the classroom experience. Now, earlier we talked about the importance of incorporating stories, how people remember that, how we can have a, a, a nice uh, story point of, of various personal stories that we can interject. We take you to that next level and we'll split up those stories to fit in with various parts of our instruction. It does take time, it does take effort, but I invite you to check your experience with it. So I'm going to put in a couple storylines into your program. If you're doing multiple events, they click on this with a very cool uh, finale and also a very great introduction to that next event. An opener is always a very, very important thing. I always say you want to have the opener down to a science. It's because if you're ever nervous or worried about a presentation, you don't need to be if you've rehearsed your re opener 20 times, 50 times, 100 times. If you have it down to a T, you just can do it. Your opener, you do need to practice it 50 to 100 times and have it down to a science. Now it's going to change over time, so initially start to work it, start to craft it, see how it works, get the feedback, make your changes. You want to have some really good openers for all the different audiences that you work with. And that five minutes is extremely helpful. When you go out to a really good site, and there's a lot of people when you go out, first get out to a school, and then again, now I think you guys can see out in the beginning. For those of you that are watching the recorded version of this event, go back to the beginning. Take this study up. Now we are going to get off, because I forgot to hit the record button, so it's time to make a thing. Few minutes that you already talked. You want to make sure that you have a strong opener. Practice that at the beginning and make sure everything is in order. Now, things don't always go well, but if you're used to giving a presentation, if you talk to many times, you can get right back on tape. Now, that opener can really set the stage for the entire event. If you have a good opener, it gives you a confidence. You feel that flow, that voice is going at the pace you want. Then you're asking the audience for a while. And not only do you can say it's a good kind of presentation. If you can have an opener that talks to many times, you're nervous. Sometimes you get off to it right away. Sometimes you're not on course right away. You want to hear the entire event for you. So practice your opener. Make sure you know you're in the truth. If you wake up and actually say it's a good one, no notes on the opener. We want you to have that down. And you say, your first few events to have some notes. And if you start to practice that, you get a really good opener that to the audience, and if you know the work, memorize that. Practice, practice, practice. So when you go in, you can say just like that. Let's move into the motivation piece. Still, but this one, instead of a hook, we're talking about creating that emotional response. Again, emotions are what drive people to take action. Our goal is to leverage that so they can take positive action towards their financial future. We talked a lot about this before. The fear freeze, you know, when people don't know something, they freeze up. They get worried. They don't take the initiative. We talked about it too when we talked about the trans theoretical model of behavior changes. When they're worried, when they're scared, sometimes they can revert back into the former stages of change. So it is very important we are very careful with this creating emotional response. Initially, I want you to focus on more of the positive emotional responses, but you can leverage the safe emotional responses as well. For young adults, if you're working with them, a thing like rebelliousness is pretty safe, and even adults. If we're talking to people about embarrassment, now that may be safer with maybe kids or teens, but when it comes to financial embarrassment, sometimes that can raise a red flag with adults and bring back some painful memories. And you have to understand that could even bring back painful memories for our young kids because they're seeing the struggles that their parents are going through. So again, initially, focus on those emotional responses that are positive. Again, you can integrate some things that may be more neutral, like rebelliousness, as you're gaining the skills and capability as an instructor. So for instance, if 
and you can use the other door. And so it's good when you use the right one. Uh, if you ever want the truth on it, which talk about cigarette smoking, they leverage this really well. And it's a great question of how you can leverage the feeling of a dying to get people to take action. And this, may, this feeling also may work well with people that are in credit card debt. So let's say you're working with adults in credit card debt. We can leverage this particular emotion because oftentimes these people are upset at credit card companies. They feel like they're almost taking advantage of the many cases. So we can leverage this to get them to take uh, so that's really important to do. Initially, you want to let it more with positive emotions and those emotions in those gray areas. If you get too much into those negative emotions and you're not sophisticated enough to do so properly, what can happen is we can revert people back to earlier stages in their way of the pain. So we need to be very careful. We don't want to turn somebody off of learning and really drive that emotional nail to the heart where they're just, they're just over it. Um, so, be very careful when you're leveraging emotions, uh, especially something like embarrassment. For instance, when we're talking to kids and teens about this, it's a lot safer emotion because they haven't typically had financial mistakes that they've made. So, if we're talking about embarrassment and financial mistakes, with kids and kids, we may be able to use embarrassment. But with adults, that's a whole other thing because they have a personal attachment. Maybe they may need to qualify for a loan and they won't qualify. And that sense of embarrassment just makes them feel small. They don't want to learn, they want to give up. So be very, very careful with how you love your emotions. But in the same token, it could be a very powerful legitimate thing. In today's age, what do we see in the news every day? Worry about the economy, jobs, bankruptcies, foreclosures, all these problems people are facing. It's on the top of the news every hour. It's always featured almost every day and right now. And the crazy thing is that we have the answer for these problems. It's financial literacy, improving the financial capability, helping the people gain the knowledge that will take them to the next level. But they still feature the problem. If we had a cure for cancer, they'd probably feature that cure for cancer every day. And by the way, I do hope that they have a cure for that. But the encouragement, we need to get people through that. Even kids and teens are seeing that in the news and seeing that their parents are worrying. For adults, it's apparent. You could talk to adults, many of them are worried about their jobs, about this, that, and the other thing. We need to give them that encouragement to help them break through a lot of those negative things that they've been seeing. The envisioning. This is big. It will help them put them into a future state so they're seeing their future. I talked about this a little before. Let's think back to the educational sales close future person technique. We want to make sure we're giving them the vision of that brighter future. For instance, because you know this, you'll be able to avoid the stress and worry that comes from getting turned down for a loan. Or, because of this, you'll be able to enjoy the best terms of your next home loan, so you have more money in your pocket. So you can not only own a home, but you'll be saving for your retirement and your 401k, or whatever the case may be. So getting them to envision the future and then taking them to that next level is important. Once you have that home and that money in your bank account and your 401k, what are some of the things that you might enjoy doing? Bridging lifestyle back together is important because all these things work together. We're going to go through motivation, engagement, education, and movement to action activities one by one. Right now, I want you to create your own motivation plan and just go through those slides and think of sentences, statements, you know, things that you can do to make sure you're motivating your audiences here. 
Pause the video right now and create your plan to motivate your audience. You know, what's the hook and how will you create an emotional response? Thanks for pausing the video and welcome back. Let's get into the engagement piece. Interaction is key. With our curriculum, the engagement piece is built in. If you're not using that, that's okay. You can build it in as an educator because right now you're a skilled educator. How do you interact with them? Activities, questions, participation, opinions, feedback, surveys, sharing, all of these ways you can facilitate that engagement. Remember back to the last teacher that you had that interacted with the audience effectively and how you mentally compare that to a teacher that just read the lesson plan? Connecting with the audience makes you more personable and gives a completely different feel to the event. Movement includes you, the instructor, moving and getting the participants to move. Getting the students to move is helpful. It could be getting them to stand up, sit down, raise their hands. Anything that's getting them to move is really key. Even doing deep breathing exercises is helpful. You know, you know it as well as I do, when you're sedentary, it feels like you want to stay that way. You know, anything that we can do to get them to move, clapping, you know, when somebody gets it right, give them a big round of applause. Just get them to do something that gets their bodies engaged in the learning. In fact, you know right now, I just want you to shake it out a little bit. You've been watching this video. Take 60 seconds to do deep breathing while standing up and shaking out your limbs. I'll wait for you to do this. Stand up now and do this brief activity. Put the video on pause if needed. Now how do you feel? The other aspect is how you move as an instructor. Get away from the podium, take a stroll down the aisle and try to engage each participant. Be sure to give each participant a look in their eyes as you would make your way around the room. This will help you engage your audience, plus many find it improves their ability to deliver presentations with more energy. The entertainment piece is important. To clarify, you don't have to sing, juggle, do backflips, but how can you entertain the audience? You know, we talked about it before. The venue select, the music you select, maybe you could show some videos, you know, that entertain them in a different way that breaks things up. You can include some multimedia type stuff, different things. You know, stories, jokes, and activities all provide entertainment that can keep your audience engaged and in the optimum learning state. Staying flexible is an important aspect of leading a class. That's important for the engagement because when you're too rigid with that or with what you want to teach, sometimes the audience will feel that. Or when you want to push through and make sure you cover everything in the presentation, sometimes your audience feels that also. And if they feel that way, they can't interact with you. If you find the class is taking some of the lessons another direction, you may want to roll with that just for a little bit. Maybe you just started talking about a budget and they start talking about starting a business. Find ways that you can integrate budgeting into starting a business on the fly. And then you continue with that. Maybe you also had a credit lesson to get through, but they're so engaged with this, stick with it. Have the flexibility and make sure that they understand that as long as they're willing to learn, you're willing to serve them and are giving them the information they're looking for. Props can make a class interesting. You can use any type of props you want. Get creative. It just makes the class a little different than the typical ones. Videos, pictures, fake money. I've even used an old brick cell phone as props in the past. Have fun with this aspect. It adds an interesting flair to the typical presentation. By now, you know there's a lot of ways to engage your audience. Have fun with this opportunity. Take chances and push boundaries. Taking chances can make your presentation memorable. If they don't work out, have a chuckle about it. Move on. Worst case scenario is your audience will remember your failed attempt but appreciate your efforts. Just like the motivation exercises you've completed, you will be creating an engagement plan. Use the elements that are discussed and think, how will you generate this type of engagement with your audience? Press pause now and I'll see you back here in a few moments. I won't spend too much time on the education piece because a lot of this material is built into our curriculum. As you know, we have developed one of the most extensive financial education curriculum in the industry. There's over 500 classroom hours of materials for various ages. This was designed by seasoned educators, financial professionals, and personal finance experts to ensure the lessons meet the highest educational standards while being usable in the real world. 
For those of you using different curriculum, here are some tips. Memorizing terms and having them learn lessons that don't apply in life is a waste of time. They don't need to memorize anything. They'll get that over the time through good education when there's engagement and when there's some games or some activities. You know, I saw a teacher spend two class periods teaching people how to fill out their tax return. Now there's 70,000 pages of tax code and severe penalties if you mess up on your taxes. Instead, let's teach them how to find a trusted financial professional and make them aware of potential deductions that may benefit them. This was brought up several times before, but it's worth mentioning again. Integrating stories within your lesson plans, it's a great way to educate. So if you can integrate the lessons that you want to do within the stories you're sharing, it not only gives it that hook initially, but you can also educate them in that same process. Seasoned presenters and educators build a supply of stories that can be used to fit to various topics. Stories are easier to remember, so they are able to take events short notice because they have a collection of stories that they can integrate into the lesson plans. This reduces the preparation time and has a positive impact on the overall event. The educator is the most important piece of teaching personal finance, but the content you use is also a critical element. Make sure you're using content that connects with your audience. It should be age and socioeconomic background appropriate. For instance, you wouldn't go teach an adult class where debt is the biggest issue and teach advanced investment principles. Also ensure your content is aligned with standards set by the National Financial Educators Council and other national standards. We invite you to review the NFEC standards you will find them to be the most comprehensive in the industry for all ages, starting with kids in preschool through adulthood. It is important that you understand the topics you are teaching. You should get in the habit of continuing to learn about personal financial education topics. You're the educator. You need to understand more than your audience does. You want to make sure that you have that knowledge to answer the questions your audience asks of you. And if you don't know an answer to a question, that's okay. Use it as a learning experience. Great question. Let me write it down and I will get back with you. Never make up an answer. Simply compliment them on the question, promise to email them, and move on from there. The problem I see with a lot of the educators is they won't take it certain directions because they want to avoid questions they know may come up and you can see the tension rise in them and they try to steer the class in a different way. So having the knowledge will give you that confidence to allow the class to take different directions while you're still in control. So practice, practice, practice. Say your presentation out loud many times. You need to practice out loud and in front of a mirror. Initially, keep it private. Then you may want to bring in a small audience or do some classes, but practice. In each event, you want to improve. Make it better. Add some new things. Try some new things and practice that before. For our educators that are here that have been doing this for a long time, integrate a piece or two each time. Write it down. Before each class, I want you to have some very specific goals on what you want them to do and some very specific goals on the things that you want to integrate as an instructor that make you a better instructor. But practice and preparation is the key.
I want you to create a plan how to educate your audience. This one doesn't need to be as detailed, but you can start to think about your class, you know, designing that class that you want and how are you going to present it. Pause the video now. Look at the last set of notes and create your education plan. The last piece we covered this before, it's the movement to action. As you learn in the educational sales section, this is critical. Much of what we cover here will just be a refresher. What are those action steps you want your audience to take? This should be clearly defined before you begin instruction. Then prior to the end of the program, it is essential you provide them step-by-step -step instructions on what actions to take. Get them specific books to read, websites to follow, or activities to complete. In today's age, it's easy to get distracted. You start off researching a financial topic, and then the next thing you know, you end up watching cat videos. To help those that participated in your course, provide them specific action steps to help them continue the positive momentum. Remember, your action steps after class today is to review and refine those activities we discussed from designing your event to creating your education, engagement, and motivation plan. These are critical activities that will make you the best educator. We want certified financial education instructors to be the best out there and know the added effort will separate you from the herd. If possible, include an accountability component. For those teaching people over multiple class sessions, this can be easily done. Assign homework or activities you want them to complete. Make sure these are real world activities that have them working on their finances. Things like getting the credit report, completing their budget, calling their cable company to reduce their monthly bills, and other activities that will provide a tangible benefit to them. For those of you hosting a single event or, or lack the time to review everyone's work, you can suggest that they find an accountability partner in the class. Oftentimes, when people are responsible to report to another person, more action is taken. Leverage accountability in your programming and measure the impact it makes. A key ingredient to getting your participants to take action is closing them. Practice those closes we discussed in the educational sales section. The assumptive close, the alternative choice close, the Ben Franklin close, and the future person close. Be sure to use these on a regular basis through your events when the emotions are high. There are many other closes you can utilize as well. Check out online videos that demonstrate a variety of sales closes. Watch them and see if any other closing strategies resonate with you. Remember, the goal of this is to get your audience to take action. Getting the closing down will help them to do so. We here at the NFPC encourage you to find your own authentic voice. What are you talking about? Why do you want to teach personal finance? What are the stories, experiences, and challenges that you personally were a part of that makes you want to teach personal finance? Take these techniques you've learned and integrate your own personal passion into the lesson. That's a really, really critical piece. Now, when we developed this program about five years ago, we reviewed all the other training programs, and sadly, what we saw is they just were simply really critical. So, they're in the training, reading the curriculum as you would teach it to the class. We do believe that you know how to read, and when you get an instructor's guide, you'll be able to figure it out. That's why this entire training focuses on the techniques, the pedagogy, and the lessons that will help you become a more effective instructor. A big part of that is integrating your own personality into the lesson. We each have a unique story to tell, a unique reason you're here listening right now. Tap into that. Integrate your own personal stories and experiences into your lesson plan. 
is more authentic. There's a better connection with the audience. You can feel a lot more rewarded coming out of that classroom experience. Another side benefit is it takes less preparation because you know a lot of what you personally experience, and when you're integrating that into the lesson, it's a lot easier to remember and recall that information. So, we don't want a bunch of robots out there that are just reading curriculum. We want you to bring your own activity for the presentation. You'll get a lot more benefit in so many hours. We've talked about motivation several times. It's obvious and important element that's needed to be an effective financial educator. Remember, before you can motivate somebody, you need to understand what makes them tick. Whomever your target audience is, watch the movies they do, read the magazines they do, and, and enjoy the same activities they do. It will help you get that synergistic feeling with them so you understand them on a deeper level and you understand truly what motivates them. Monitor your impact through the measurement tools we talked about. Utilize that to make improvements in your presentation. Also, as you're doing this initially, some things will feel forced. They won't feel natural. So it's very important that you do it. And once you go through it a few times, then you'll forget about it. It will become a natural part of your training and material. Initially, a good trick to use, and I did this myself, I have a little note card of things that I want to try or push or do. Sooner or later, it will become part of your presentation without even thinking about it. But again, it takes practice. Monitor your impact through the measurement tools we talked about. Utilize that to make improvements in your change. Also, as you're doing this initially, some things will feel forced. They won't feel natural. So it's very important that you do it. And once you go through it a few times, then you'll forget about it. It will become a natural part of your training and material. Initially, a good trick to use, and I did this myself, I have a little note card of things that I wanted to try or push or do. So as I'd go through them, I'd check and momentarily check them and just different techniques I wanted to implement, different phrases I wanted to try, different jokes even. Anything you want to try to push boundaries, try it. Sooner or later it will become a part of your presentation without even thinking about it. But again, it takes practice. Everybody here is practicing. I know that and I appreciate you practicing. You're going to feel confident when you go to the classroom because of it. Also, you're going to do it in front of the classroom where it's a little scary, where you can make a mistake, where people can laugh at you. It doesn't happen too often. It's happened to me before. You're going to learn things through your preparation stage and things to check before you present. One of the more embarrassing times, I actually thought I was giving a very comical presentation in the beginning, but it turned out my fly was open the whole time in front of 500 people, and somebody was kind enough to tell me after my 20-minute presentation. But now that's part of my pre-presentation checklist. Check the fly. You're all going to make mistakes. You're all going to have things happen. But that's okay. Laugh it off. It's no big deal. You're doing something good that's helping people. Keep that up. This section on addressing distractions was added since we've had several requests on how to manage a class. This is a big concern, especially of people that are teaching high school students through adult learners. These tips should help you. First, it is important to think about the class energy. Are you at the point in the presentation you're teaching a harder topic or maybe a stressful personal finance lesson? Think about what's going on outside of distraction. Sometimes distractions are an early indication of boredom. Look around at others. Do they seem restless or bored? If so, change something. Do something different. Create some movement. Make a loud noise. Do an activity. Play a video. Do something to get their attention. One of the biggest ways is getting them to interact with you. Commands also work well. Listen here right now. It's really important. Listen here. Listen up. Giving them direct commands. Look at me. Direct commands work. Police train on that. Military trains on that. Why? Because it works. 
When you tell somebody something, basically something to do in that sense, oftentimes they will take notice. If it's just a few students causing direct distractions, position where you stand. You can do a lot with your body language. I like to get right up on the person that's causing the distraction. I don't address him, I just kind of look at him as I'm talking, and you can use your body in the same way. In other times, you have to address them directly. If I'm giving a presentation in a school classroom setting, the first thing I do, even before I go in, I'll tell the teacher, hey, if there's any disruptions or anything, you handle that. I'm just here to present. So I enlist them early on. So if there's something, I just point. She'll handle it. That's not my business. But typically, I like to do it myself because I enjoy that. I like to change somebody's behavior. I know when I was in high school, I kind of did the same thing oftentimes. You know, I won't admit it now, but yeah, maybe I was a little unruly sometimes. But you can address that person. I like to even call them out. So how would you like to live your life and bring things out? Put them on the spot and then enlist them later. Because typically the people that are acting out, sometimes they're the influencers in the class. So if you can kind of get them, you know, basically put them in their place a bit and then enlist them so they're on your side. It takes a full circle and then they're actually helping you with the class. Or maybe you can do an inside joke with somebody where they say something in comment and you incorporate it into your presentation. A lot of ways you could do it, but don't worry about the distraction too much. Just be prepared for them. Preventing distractions is better than addressing distractions. A lot of it can be avoided if you build that relationship and rapport with your audience early on in the presentation. Share those personal stories where they understand who you are and where you're coming from. Take time to understand their goals and let them know that you are there and you're committed to helping them achieve them. A proactive approach to enlisting your audience early on will help you prevent distractions. You'll still get a few unruly people and that's okay. Use these tips in this section to enlist them and ensure the class is productive. Thank you again for your time today and right now, take some time to review your notes from the event and activities. This will help you retain the information and implement it during your next presentation. Thank you all for listening to me now. We know your time is valuable and appreciate your interest in being the best educator possible. You will make a significant difference in someone's life. We commend you for the, your efforts. Until next time, take care.